back to Women Making Moves, where we celebrate the moves that women are making. I'm Amy Pons. I'm a master certified life coach and a soul awakener. I'm joined today with Dr. Matisa Wilbon. Dr. Matisa Wilbon is a TEDx speaker who uses her 18 years as a sociologist and 10 years as a diversity, equity, and inclusion specialist to help individuals and institutions overcome the challenges of inequity. Dr. Wilbon is the CEO of Wilbon Enterprises, a consulting firm specializing in grant writing and diversity, equity, and inclusion, strategic planning and training. She travels extensively consulting with nonprofit organizations and creating and implementing DEI plans. She's a TEDx speaker whose most recent talk entitled Good Grief has garnered thousands of views. It highlights the idea that many circumstances in life bring grief, but that grief can be a gift. In short, there is good in grief. Dr. Wilbon is an empowerment speaker. She has traveled extensively speaking for corporations, nonprofits, college campuses, and leadership groups across the country. Lastly, Dr. Wilbon is the wife of Mr. Lawrence Wilbon, Business and Development Director for Fathers Incorporated, and mother to Deshaun and Taya Wilbon. Dr. Matisa, welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Right before we hit record, I pulled off a sign from my wall to show Dr. Matisa because she has it right behind her and she has these all of these amazing signs and energy behind her. And I feel her incredible energy. So we're we're <laughs> new friends, we're newbies, and it's exciting to get yep. together today. So Dr. Matisa, what are the moves that you are excited to be making right now? Ooh, what an amazing question. Um, a couple of things. So as you talked about with my bio, I'm doing, I've been doing diversity, equity, and inclusion kind of work for a really long time. Professor for 12 years, full-time, did that, loved being in the classroom, loved my students, and I still teach. But what I realized, Amy, was that I really needed to kind of be out. Like the message that I was supposed to give was supposed to go beyond the classroom. So the moves that I'm making right now is to take the message of what I call everyday equity and, and spreading it abroad. I'm doing it in public spaces. I'm about to do a live series soon across organizations, universities, because what I find is that everybody hears this term equity and it seems like it's so big and it's so broad and you know there's, there's pushback here and pushback there. But when we think about the fact that as human beings, we should be living equity every single day. That, I think, is going to be the thing that moves the needles from the boardroom to the classroom to our kitchen tables. So that's what I'm doing right now. That's one thing that I'm super excited about. That's beautiful. And I, of course, have questions. So <laughs> I love that you're going into the college level. And do you mean high school as well or co just college? Mostly college, yes. But I love yeah. that you're going younger because what I see happening in my experience is there is an intergenerational divide between, and especially mm -hmm. in the workplace. And this is where I felt my biggest pinch was the boomers only know how to do boomer way, X mm -hmm. learned from boomers, X taught yeah. millennials. Millennials are starting to break out of what they've always been taught. And then Gen Z is like, mm -hmm. I'm out. So, and then <laughs> And seemingly none of them, <clears throat> there's, there's anger, resentment, especially between Z and Boomer, you know, there's the intergenerational is, is really where I feel personally, that there's such mm -hmm. a, the, the equity divide, mm -hmm. along with white supremacy, so many things are happening. But I, yeah. I, I see, I see you agreeing with the intergenerational. What do you think about that notion? No, I think, I think that's, that's spot on. I really do. One of the reasons why I love being in the classroom is because I get to really get the pulse of what students are thinking. And it's funny because I had a student at a class yesterday and we were talking about culture. And one of the things that I talked about was the importance of language and culture. And I was kind of making them laugh because of course I was using language that's probably outdated since last week. I have teenagers though, so they always keep me in the loop. But one of the things that I thought was really good is the fact that I could really disarm them by saying, you know, I'm probably not using the correct term. But then we start talking about terms that we're all familiar with so that we can be on the same page. And I think that's the thing that we don't do enough. Mm -hmm. I understand, you know, I think the term that I said, I was like, if I say to you, this is fire. That's a term that my kids use all the time. That's fire. I don't physically mean there's fire in front of me, of course, but there was a generation or a time when that would have been true. They would have taken it literally. And just using that as an example 
gave us some common ground to have some real conversations because we're eventually going to talk about deeper issues that people are really concerned about, that they're concerned about, just like boomers are concerned about. You know, they're concerned about the economy. They just don't articulate it in the same way. So I think you're right. If we can learn to bridge that gap, it's going to be better for all of us. You bring up common ground and that's, that's the brilliance because right now it's seemingly we don't have any, that's not really true. And the way that I'm kind of talking about it, especially with women is I'm bringing it together in the process of bringing together multi-generational women to talk about, you know, until the nineties, Western medical doctors were educated on a male body. So things like, like we were taught, we have a menstrual cycle and it was correlated to a procreation or a baby, but like, what else? Like endometriosis, Mm -hmm. fibroids, like, so women from a woman's health perspective, perimenopause, Mm -hmm. menopause, that's kind of like, I'm finding that's a great equalizer with women across many generations, because we all kind of want and need that community and that guidance that we didn't, we didn't learn. Um, But then also like opening the conversation. And to your point, I love that because common ground helps everyone feel kind of safe in, 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 in sharing and, and sharing their own unique voice or opinion, as long as everyone's Mm -hmm. able to receive it that way and not pull back or retreat when there's something that they don't agree with. Right. No, I agree. I, I love that. I love that. And you need to pull me in. Like, I want to be a part of that conversation. I don't know. If it's yes, Dr. I feel you're in. Um, you're in. <laughs> but, but I do think you're exactly right. And, and that's, that for me is what everyday equity really is about. We do have more in common than we do different, but that isn't to negate difference, right? The difference doesn't have to create division or, you know, you don't have to be an enemy because there is difference, but we have to understand their, you know, what the common ground is, understand the difference, understand how that could still bring us together. And I think we need more of that. We need more of those conversations, to your point, intergenerationally. Students need to know, or kids need, younger people need to know that boomers aren't against them. And that I think is what we're missing because people, you know, oh, you're boomer. That that was a big saying over the summer or whenever. But then also we dismiss those younger generations because we think, oh, you know, nothing, none of that's true. Right. And so I think this, this is an important conversation to to be had across industry, across sector, anywhere. And that's exactly right. And it's going to take a little bit of time, uh, you know, to, to help people really truly feel safe. Because again, me specifically at 41, I'd been trained that in corporate America, which is like, my door's always open. This is a safe space. That wasn't true. You know what I mean? So like, actually, (laughs) right. Uh, to to these people that, you know, this is actually a safe space and you're not going to get harmed by this. It's going to take some trust and rapport and time. Absolutely. One of the things that I do get a little spicy with boomers about or X is when they say, and by the way, I'm like the oldest, like last millennial there, there was, uh, I'm on the, the brink, but um, when they'll say something like everyone's so sensitive today, I can't say anything. <sighs> Oh, sigh. Mm-hmm. That's not true. <laughs> what What is true is that you've been saying these things your entire life. Yes, that's that's true. You, you were in a different time, mm-hmm. though. And it's not so much mm-hmm. that people are more sensitive is that it was never OK to say those things. Yeah. And those yep. people can feel safe telling you that. So it's honoring other people's boundaries. That's really what it's about when we're saying like if we say woke or something like that, it's like really that you're, you're attuning mm-hmm. to someone outside yourself when you are presenting your words or to them, you know, that's really what it's about. So that's the, that's the one I'll get a little spicy about. And I have to go inward and find my peace before I respond. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think that's important, but again, and you said something really, really important earlier, you talked about trust and safety, right? Because even in, in those kinds of conversations, disagreement doesn't have to be disagreeable. And there should be an openness to have these really important conversations. And if it's important to me, it should be important to you, even if it's different, even if it's something, you know, that's going to make you uncomfortable, because that's the thing. It's not just that, you know, people are so sensitive. No, you don't want to be uncomfortable because now you're being checked on the things that that are being, you know, said. And I try to practice as much as I can calling people in. Instead of calling people out, I am someone who believes very strongly in equity, very strongly in making sure that we speak truth to power. 
But I'm also, my intention is always to still try to bring us together. And that's a different approach. You know, some people are very, you know, I got to be in your face. I've got to make sure that you understand that I'm speaking truth to power. And I think that's important. But if the goal is not to help bring people together, then for me, we're losing anyway. Like, what are we doing it for? I'm doing it so we can have these these uncomfortable conversations in a, in a safe space. I love exactly what you're saying. And I would love to hear your example of calling someone in versus out. I think I need that de- declaration. And and I found myself doing that. Uh, and we have like a saying in coaching, like coaching without consent is bullying. So you always before you inject your thoughts or you're, you know, on someone, may I share my perspective? You know, try to have a little grace for both. And I used mm-hmm. to be the person, that's why I say, I think I said to you earlier, I like, I'm a healing angry woman because I used to just inject rage out and I would call out right. and that was mine to heal because I was really hurt with all the things that are happening. So how do you call someone in versus out? Yeah. So, so calling someone out is using language like you said, and you did, et cetera, but calling someone in for me really is asking questions. So it is the question of, I heard you say, but tell me more. And when you, when you continue to do that, tell me more, then you can really get to the heart. So if somebody says in the extreme, these people are like this, well, tell me more. Tell, and then they give you the answer. Well, can you tell me more? And what you typically get to the heart of is maybe one experience that they had with an individual who who looks like the person that they're talking about or something that their family, you know, always said at the dinner table. And so calling them in is inviting them to share their perspective so that you can help get to the heart or the root of why they feel the way that they feel, as opposed to creating a wall because you're just intent on telling them why they're wrong. And it could be truth, (laughs) right? I get it. You could be telling the absolute truth. That is offensive. And I think there is a time, of course, for you to share from your perspective. But again, if you can do it in a way that shows them that you're not trying to simply dismiss them or build a wall so that they can be defensive, but you're really inviting them into an uncomfortable conversation to help them see why their perspective may be antiquated or bigoted. I don't suggest at all that you have to always tiptoe, but it is in an effort to invite as opposed to push away. I love that distinction that you just gave because what I typically do, and it's probably the way I respond, if someone tells a racist bigoted joke of any kind. I'm like, Ooh, help me understand. Well, you can see you're already on guard is the way, the way I responded was uh-huh. you're I'm putting that person already on guard and they're like, Oh, Oh gosh, <laughs> what did I just step into? Cause like I'm pissed. <laughs> so but, right. like, in theory, I like to call in, but I end up calling out just by like my, <laughs> my sheer energy toward the person. So I'm like, I'm like, Ooh, <laughs> like, and I'm like, let's go, let's go to the, let's go to the races. <laughs> So thank you. And and sometimes it's hard. I mean, it's hard because it evokes all of these emotions and feelings for you. And you just want to, and and I'll be honest, I don't always call in. I mean, sometimes I'm like, um, excuse me, I'm practicing, practicing calling in instead of calling out. We're, we're, (laughs) we are self-aware and it's progress, not perfection. Of course, all of those things. I just, we kind of touched on this before we started recording, but I know this to be true that even before we're born, especially as women, we have already absorbed the wounds, the experiences, the traumas of our mom, our grandma, our great grandma, our great, great grandma. It's all in there. It's a big soup. Mm -hmm. And that's in our DNA before we even step foot in our own experiences. And then when we're here, ages one to seven, everything that we experience in here is fact. So for instance, if I was called a chubby baby, that I, I, I'm a baby, but I hear that. And that's now inside me. So that kind of stuff ramps up hard when I do hear those things. And it, it's possible that it's not my energy coming forward. It could be my great, great grandma that was persecuted for telling her truth and things like that. Mm -hmm. It's somebody in there and she's not wrong. So I try to honor both and say like, thank you for coming in. I appreciate it. I feel safe with this person in front of me. I will Mm -hmm. extend the call in, you know, so it's, it's just, 
kind of giving yourself a pause. So thank you for explaining that. <laughs> well, and I'll say too, I think you're exactly right. You know, as you were talking, my mom's picture, I know the listeners can't see it, but my mom's picture is prominently on my wall because, you know, her, both her, her experience is good and bad and the things she persevered through, severely abused, that kind of background, but was an amazing mom who never abused us. And, but worked through her worked through her stuff for sure ended up going back to school to become a registered nurse with five children after divorce so when i talk about like she rose she is at the top of my list for sure and i know that i've had to work through you know trauma that she experienced but also would have been able to grab onto the perseverance and the dedication and the work ethic that she had but I also think about the fact that the people that I'm speaking with whom I'm speaking also have had trauma and also have had, you know, years of things that they don't even realize that they've ingested, right? Bigotry and that they really have taken um, for granted as fact as this is the way life is. So I'm wading through my stuff at the same time that I have to realize they're wading through their stuff. Now, should I have to jump through hoops because of what they're dealing with? Not necessarily. But the human experience is the human experience. And if I want to give myself grace, at least from my perspective, I have to at least extend a bit of grace for the people that I'm you know, dealing with as well. So that's what I try to think about in all of this. You're absolutely right. And I think the biggest difference for me as I interact with those humans is, is that human working on that stuff? And if so, I might yeah. stay and, and learn from the conversation of that experience. If they are not doing anything to further their expansion of consciousness or their growth or things that they've endured, then I choose to protect my peace and remove myself from that situation. 100%. Yep. Beautiful. We got to one move that you were making and here we are. Are there other moves <laughs> that you want to share? You said you had a few. You wanted, so I want to make sure to express anything that you want to share here to get out to the folks. Yeah, thank you. So the next move is I recently developed something that I'm calling, it's actually called diverse, uh, excuse me, disrupt her, which I consider myself, disrupt her university. Started as disrupt her network, which was just a network of women um, that I've been helping to empower to realize that because of our, our stuff, our trauma and all of the things that we deal with, that sometimes we have to really look within to disrupt patterns of thinking and patterns of behavior, get to the root of it. And, you know, for me, a disruptor is someone who dismantles and disrupts old systems to rebuild so that it's more inclusive, inclusive of good thoughts and good things. But I've shifted that and broadened it to disruptors university because it also includes a set of horses and teachings that I do from anywhere to, you know, disrupting imposter syndrome, to resilience, to all of those things that I in my life have experienced as, as barriers or things that I've needed to move forward. And so the, the, the really amazing thing that I'm doing right now is just really building this Disruptors University, this network of women who are being empowered to go out and take the world by storm. Because as a woman for, for me, and I don't know if you've had this experience, it didn't matter my accomplishment. It didn't matter my degrees. I always found myself thinking, am I good enough? You know, all of those common questions. Am I an imposter? All of those things. And I just really made a decision to say, I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. Heck yeah, I'm good enough. Heck yeah, I'm worth it. Heck yeah, I've earned my spot at this table. But I had to come to that conclusion after a lot of work. And I realized that there were other women just like me, younger, some older, who were asking those same questions. And I'm excited because once this is really established in the way that I want it to be, I'm going to go down to the younger ages. So middle school, my daughter's 13. I've started her young so that she can realize that she's worthy enough and she's right exactly where she needs to be. And so I feel like if we can really talking about this intergenerational conversations, if we can start early, we can start really equipping a lot of these young women to just show up. They don't have to deal with the things that we've had to deal with. They just have to show up as their authentic selves and just go for it. One of the things I feel that's so true based on what you just said is, and that I've experienced personally within the intergenerational women at this point, 
women do come out of their shell and kind of remember who the F they are. It historically yeah. takes, it, it's like older and older. It's like maybe like 50s, 60s. It's getting younger to where like yeah. I'm, I'm 41. I'm like, oh, I remember I'm here and I have a mm-hmm. lot still to heal through and work through. But also I love what you're doing because it, there was a time where all of us, I'll, I'll stay with women here. We're born with all of that. We're born being less than we're born with the wounds of being persecuted, of never being able to talk or explore, be as a woman, especially anyone in our orbit from the fifties. Oh my gosh. The divine feminine was exiled thousands of years ago. So we're riding with all of that, the moment we're born. So there's like a glimpse through childhood where you're, you're standing in yourself because you don't know what else to be. And you're not feeling all of that yet. And it's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And you have, you, you have fantasies and you imagine and you play and you start to see, and I love what you said, your daughter's 13. Those are the times where you're just like, you can see who she is and amplify that. And you're like, listen, you might feel some things, all these generations of women before you, but remember Mm -hmm. who you are, stay firm in that. And that's how they go in unapologetically into this world and saying, I heard something along the lines of like, well, women have just let it happen. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Surprises in me on that one. I said, so you're suggesting that I let myself get abused in corporate for 20 years. And they're like, well, I'm like, yeah, let's walk that back a little bit because we know, was there stuff in me that was a pattern? Yeah, absolutely. Was there, is the workplace broken? Yeah, absolutely. Both can be true. Yeah. And it wasn't that I was sitting there compliant to this abuse. And that's what I, mm-hmm. that's what I heard. And I had to like, put power down here in a good way. But I was yeah. like, I said, help me understand. So. Yeah, no, I think you're right. It, and it is, it is systemic for me, from a sociological perspective, I always think about the fact that, you know, we do have culture and like, you said there are patterns and ways of thinking, but it's it's within the context of a particular system. So we're socialized and have been, women have been for years and years and years about how to be. And it's really hard to really unpack it. it starts really from birth, how one group is supposed to be the people who succeed in a certain way. And one group is supposed to be. So I agree with you 1000% that we have to really look at these systems. It's interesting as we're sitting here talking You know, my daughter, who is 13 years old, as I said, unfortunately, since she's been in middle school, she's really been having a lot more trouble with the girls in her in her orbit. And I was thinking back to my middle school years. Of course, that's the time where you are trying to learn yourself and there's drama. We use that term. But the question becomes. What what kind of system creates that kind of drama, particularly for girls? What would happen if we were empowering all of them to realize you don't have to infight to try to get whatever it is that you're that you're trying to get? A lot of that competition is bred because there's a system that says there only can be a certain number or a certain way that girls have to look or a certain way that girls have to be. And then you get to rise to the top. I think that's why a lot of that drama and fighting and all of that happens. And so it just makes me think just about the importance of this kind of conversation and teaching. We've done this. I've done this. My husband, you know, is an ally and does this for and has for our daughter all of her life, but it's not until you get into those situations that you have to apply what you've heard at the kitchen table and the, you know, the dining room table. We've had conversations, but it's when you get there. Last thing, my daughter wants to be an actress and has forever, forever and ever and ever. And I know what kind of industry that is. And so we've been teaching her and, and putting confidence in her. And I remember one day she asked me, she was like, mom, a couple of months ago, she was like, do you think I'm going to make it to the big screen? Do you think I'm going to you know, be this amazing actress. And my question back to her was, what do you think? Because I wanted her to learn and continue to learn. It doesn't matter. Of course, I think you are. I think you're amazing. What do you think? Because that's what it comes down to. And that's at the end of the day for me, what Disruptors University is about. What do you think? And if you think anything other than you are magic, (laughs) right? Or that you are amazing or that you are worthy or that you can do anything. If you think anything other than that, let's work. Because by the time you come out of this, I want you to think who you are. 
your identity, right? You're amazing. You're amazing. Oh my gosh. I wish I could reach through the screen and hug you. And I, I, I go to those little young ladies who are tearing each other down. It's hard not to look at that and not blame someone, especially as women, because we've always been taught that our lot in life is due to like mostly another woman. That's what the patriarchy has bred as well is that women need to go after each other. So I love that in those moments. And then I love your university because when that happens in the school place, teachers don't have time to sit the ladies down and say, let's unpack this. (laughs) Why are you going after each other? This is not how it Help me understand mm-hmm. why you're going at each other. It doesn't have to be that way. So I just want to understand it. They don't have time to do that. Yeah. And right. if if those young ladies have only seen, and I'm not blaming their mothers, but like if, if they see like a girl's night at, as, as adults and they're like, oh, I want to do that. And they've seen something and mm-hmm. they're going to bring that. That's mm-hmm. all they know. So we're all doing the best we can and what we've learned. And then it's about realizing mm-hmm. what do I want to unlearn? And that's where, that's right. that's where the beauty and the magic comes back in. I'm going to be weird and awesome and powerful and magical. All the things. Dr. Matisse, thank you. So we just talked about Disruptor University. When does that go live? Great question. In October. I'm so excited. Oh, around the corner. All the women listening today that want to go to Disruptor University, how do they get to you? How, how do they sign up for it? They can go to my website, matissawilbin.com. matissawilbin.com. They can also just email me and I'd love to send out information. It's info at matissawilbin.com. Perfect. And we'll put that on the show notes as well. Is there any other move that you'd like to talk about before we move to the next question? So I'm excited to talk about the fact that I just did a TED Talk. It's on YouTube. Super, super excited about that. The thing that I love about this particular TED Talk, it's actually, it's actually on grief. All right. Some people are like, oh my gosh, grief, equity, how does that all connect? (laughs) I'll tell you how. For me personally, I've had a number of of deaths over the years. My mom passed away in 2017. Last year, my brother died unexpectedly. And I had all of these emotions. And I thought, how do I deal with this, right? There wasn't a lot of conversation around grief. And what I discovered is grief comes from loss, generally speaking, not just the loss of the loved one, but the loss of identity, which I have dealt with professionally, the loss of relationships. The year my mom passed away, um, my whole family moved from Kentucky to Atlanta. Why I did that? I don't know. But, but I wanted to be closer to family because I felt like I was a voice within my family. And I said all of that to say, I started exploring this idea of grief. And what I've found is that these emotions that we have, anger, the frustration, the sadness, they're not bad in context. You just have to learn how to deal with them. And you have to redefine what that looks like for you. And so I started developing these these resources for myself. I started looking at things that my mom loved and figuring out how that could impact me. I started storytelling. That was healing for me. I started journaling. That was healing for me. And so that TED Talk Thankfully, a lot of folks have been able to watch it and heal individually. But what I've discovered is that a lot of us are living in grief. We just haven't acknowledged or identified it as such. And when I started acknowledging that not just the death of my mom, but when I went from academia to being an entrepreneur, there was some grief there. I would always identified myself as a professor. What does that look like for me now? Who am I now? So when I identified those things, I could start working through trauma, working through the grief, dealing with my emotions, living with my anger and not being mad at myself because I felt that. So that was big for me. That's on YouTube for anybody who might want to see it. I just put in an application for my next TED Talk. So I'm excited about that. It's more in the equity space. But I'm just finding that I have all of these things that I want to be able to share with folks And the TEDx stage is one that I can do that. And it's a safe space for me to be vulnerable, to really share. And and I hope plant seeds that will help people hear it and not just say, "Mm, that was a good TED Talk, but be moved to action. And that's really, really the vein that I'm in right. So thank you for allowing me to share that. How beautiful is that? I love how you tied together that grief doesn't have to be only tied to a loss of a loved one. Grief happens 
what comes up for me is a year ago when I left corporate after 20 years, that's only what I had ever known and starting a new business. There's grief everywhere. So I can't wait to tune in and I'll include that in the show notes. So thank you for sharing that. That's the whole segment. No. So awesome. This is the, the next piece is what I like to do is I go on and I, I read a uh, recent posts that you've made. And I like to share one live, what really resonated with me and why, and I'd love to hear what helped you to feel motivated, posted, and like what is kind of behind the post. So this is from two days ago on LinkedIn. When is the last time you felt invisible, unseen? Mm -hmm. I felt that way plenty of times in the classroom, among peers, in conference rooms. I remember sitting in a room for a meeting I was leading, only to have a board member look past me to someone who appeared to be in charge. I made a commitment in moments like that to intentionally be inclusive. I wanted to be a voice for the voiceless and to debunk myths of who should belong while making sure we all do. If I could go back and tell my younger self anything, I would tell her that her invisibility is her superpower. It would be the thing that propelled her to make everyone heard, seen, and validated. Your voice, young lady, will be used to amplify the voices of others, and together, y'all will be real loud. <gasps> and there's this gorgeous, <laughs> gorgeous picture of this baby girl on the uh, on the page, which I think is you. Uh-huh. Oh, what a gorgeous tie into what we've been talking about. Tell me about this post. Yeah. Wow, it almost as you read it, it almost brought tears to my eyes. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about I'm always doing what I call a heart check for the work that I do, right? For me, what I do is not about a position or a title. It's not about work per se. It's a purpose for me. It's a call. And I do these checks where I think about the why behind. And I was just thinking about in that moment, I was thinking, okay, why do I do what I do? Why is equity important? It's not, it's not trendy. It's not kind of the thing to do, but it's what I do for life. And part of the reason is because I can remember the little girl in the picture. I can remember being one of the only kids of color at that time in the classroom. And I can remember some semblance of an invisibility starting then. But throughout various points of my life, I tell the story, as you quoted, of being in a boardroom where I'm the person that's supposed to lead the meeting, but because I didn't look like, you know, who's supposed to be in charge, you know, the question is, okay, who's leading? Who, who's the, the lead here? And it, it's me all the time. That's invisibility. But then I started reflecting back to the little girl and remembering times when I thought, okay, I might feel invisible. I'm going to make sure that other people don't feel invisible. I remember, for example, being in a psychology class and, and looking around on a campus, college campus, where I was one of the only few students of color, no faculty of color at all in the entire university for the four year, for the three years that I was there, no administrators, no leaders, no board of, you know, board members, nobody of color. And here I am, this college co-ed, excited about school, walking into a classroom thinking, I've made it, I've arrived on this college campus, and finding myself in a very similar position that I just left high school, right? But this is what was so, this is what I'll kind of end with. I, I could talk about this all day. But in that moment, I remember thinking, I am going to be the change that I want to see. I'm going to get a PhD. Now I'm a college freshman, first generation college student. I didn't know that this was going to be the hardest thing that I would ever do in my entire life. But I was committed because I thought to myself, when I teach, I want all students, not just students of color, but I want all students to have a richer experience because they have a faculty member of color, a faculty member. I, I purposely ended that post by saying y'all because I'm from Appalachia, which is very important to me. I purposely didn't grammatically make, you know, the end of it real loud. I know it's supposed to be really loud, but I did that because I code switched a little bit um, because that's how I would speak in my community. I put all of those things together because all of that makes me authentically who I am. And so I made the decision that my invisibility would be the catalyst for making sure that my classroom, the boardroom, wherever I am, my everyday equity would be to be inclusive. So that's what I was thinking in the moment. That's been my life's work. It's been my joy. And that's why I do what I do. Ooh, thank you. You are the light. You are the change. It's hard for me to not scold the people that are making us feel sure. invisible, but mm -hmm. also 
what if I could look at a little picture of that little boy? Yeah. Is is he meaning to make, or is it what he's learned? And that's Mm -hmm. where I really, that's where like my biggest work is, is trying to find the grace. I really want to believe it's all learned and we can unlearn it. I really want to. And and if people don't want to unlearn it, that we can create a system that they just decide I can't, I can't work within this, right? Because it doesn't fit me. And so that's, that's the other part of it. Right. Because right now the system doesn't, and I'm not at all speaking for all women, but, and we are seeing huge movements like the great resignation and these women leaving in droves still today. I'm one of them because Mm -hmm. that does not work for us. It was not designed with us in mind. And so we said, okay, bye. And Mm -hmm. it's going to take many years to kind of get us back. If ever. That's right. right. Thank you for this beautiful post. And Thank you for being that voice. Okay. And thank you for the work that you do. Yeah, absolutely. What would you say to, based on the first couple moves that you shared with us and this beautiful post that you shared with us, what would you say mm-hmm. to those out there that support your work and were like, hell yes, Disruptor University, let's go. And then also, what would you say if someone's listening and uh, maybe maybe it's a person who identifies as a man and they say, what about the men? What would you share with mm-hmm. both those folks? I would say for both of them, it's kind of the same answer. Be be a disruptor or a disruptor, period, right? The thing about it, we've nuanced equity in a way that we have suggested that it's only a particular type of person who should do it because they're the ones that's affected. But the reality is inequity impacts us all, right? When I think about how, you know, I think about myself, I come from, as I talked about, Appalachia. There are so many people, so many bright, brilliant people from that region who never got the chance to go to college. They didn't have access. They never really left the area because they didn't think college was for them or they didn't think that they could make a difference. And when I think about my peers, people that I went to school with, and I think about that, it wasn't that I was just the brightest. It was this, it was that I had the opportunity to get out. I had the access. I had the exposure. My point in saying that is because of some inequities that kept them in that space, we didn't get the bright minds that could have, you know, cured cancer or could have done all of these amazing things. That's the damage of inequity, not just to the soul, not just to the morale, but it is that we don't get all of the people that are kind of left behind. So what I would say to individuals who think, you know, this is just for a particular group, no, it's for the good of the whole of society. Like when you do this work, when you create space for others, when you, cre- you know, look at systems that are broken and help to fix them, you're helping all of society. And I would say to that woman who's feeling this, it's resonating with them. What I would suggest is go, be that disruptor, find your place. What I'm doing might not be what you're doing, but look at the why behind. Think about times that you might've felt invisible or you didn't feel like your voice was heard. Think about those people that you know would not only benefit from access, but the world would benefit because if they're there, it's going to be better and find your place in the work. If you identify as a man, if you identify, no matter how you identify, find your place in the work of creating everyday equity so that your hiring changes, so that the way that you do business changes, so that the way you think about people changes. And I believe if we can just do that, if we can just do that, I think we would make a big difference in our personal and professional lives. We would, if not even just by one degree every single day. And I, I love that because for me, that's that's the big message that I'm trying to push. Again, you know, some people say, well, I'm not, I'm not in a position to do X, Y, Z. But the reality is you are. Mm-hmm. You're in the position, right? I'll give this very, very quick example. When I was teaching full time, I'm a sociologist, but there would be times that I would be on the search committee for a new chemistry professor, or I would be on the search committee for a new music professor. And I would be asking hard questions like out of you know all the pool of potential chemistry professors, what's the diversity look like? And I'm a sociology professor. That wasn't my job per se. But because of my lens, because I always come from an equitable lens, I'm asking these questions. 
And I would get so much pushback where people would say, but I, I teach chemistry. Why should I have to think about diversity? Well, because diversity is going to make us all richer, right? And it's, it's what happens is people relegate it to that's your job. You're the diversity expert. That's your job. No, making this community better is all of our jobs. And my lens might be, I'm a chemistry professor. And that's true. We want, that's the content that you're supposed to, you know, the expertise you're supposed to lend. But if you're, if your lens is, how can we create equity across this campus? You won't be okay with the pool of only white males for this position. You won't be okay. That's everyday equity. It's not that I'm, you know, this is my job per se, but my job is to make this campus better. And so I can't be okay with the same, doing the same thing and hoping for a different result. And so I would just leave this with your listeners as I leave it with mine. Everyday equity is saying, how can I make sure that when I go to the store and, I, and, and not that you don't have your own stuff and you're not going to the store, you know, to, to only do this, but, but it's still true that people of color get followed. Mm-hmm. Right. The true purity follow people. Of, it's, it's true. Everyday equity says, if I see it, I'm going to say something. I'm going to speak up. I might not walk around the store looking for it, but if I see it, that's my opportunity to lend voice, to be an ally for someone that I know is being treated in unfairly. So if that could be my lens. That's my everyday lens. It will lend itself to the opportunity to make the space better. Mm, Everyday equity. It feels amazing when, for me specifically, when a man comes forward and says something along the lines of like true equity, I was like, it's not the norm. And when it happens, it's like, it's so refreshing. Yeah. You feel supported. You feel backed up. And the reality is, this is the way I think about it. We really need each other. I want to, and I don't, I'm not a kumbaya kind of person. So it's not like, oh, let's just all link arms. Like I'm not, I'm not naive. I want to link arms. You know, (laughs) I do like to link arms. (laughs) But when I look at, you know, I teach, I teach all of these amazing students. And one of the things that I, that I talk about is social change and social movements. And when I look at the civil rights movement, just as, as an example of how change can happen throughout an entire society, there's no way that the civil rights movement would have been successful without white folks, without, you know, all kinds of religious backgrounds and faith communities. It would not have happened. Even reluctant people, right? And I won't get into it. I won't name names. But there are some political folks, for example, who signed bills and did things to improve the civil rights movement that only did it for their own personal gain. But the outcome was that it positively impacted an entire group, shifted an entire society. Now, of course, you want people to be allies. You want people to have the good intentions. But the point that I'm making is, I think it is a bit naive to suggest that everybody in society is just going to have this equitable lens and we're just going to all be equal. No, that's not going to happen. But I do believe that we can get a critical mass. And usually I'm speaking to there's always going to be a subset of people who are not going to be allies. They're still going to think that what they think. There are going to be these people like us who are going to be cheerleaders and rah rah and let's do it. Then there are going to be these people in the middle that if I can just shift you to our side <laughs> so that there's a critical mass, that's when movement can really happen. That's gorgeous. Dr. Matisse, where do we find you? Oh, good question. So I'm on Instagram, Matisse Wilbin. I'm on LinkedIn, Matisse Wilbin, PhD. And of course, I gave you my website already, MatissaWilden.com. All of those places would love to connect and love to further the conversation. Thank you for helping me heal by one degree during this hour of uh, when I feel a little bit raging. Thank you for that. Any last closing remarks that you would share? Well, thank you, first of all, for this, this opportunity. It's been a pleasure and a joy talking to you. It really has. I would just say for the person who's listening, dig within and find the commonality of the person that that we're trying to help. When I ask the question, have you ever felt invisible? The answer for all of us, no matter our background, no matter who we are, how we identify, we've all felt that. 
my goal is to help us not to have to feel that. And sometimes we have to dig into that space, that time, that scenario to help us find the common ground with others. And I think if we can do more of that, again, we're going to move the needle to this goal of inclusion for all. Thank you, Dr. Matisa. Thank you.